launched on the gridiron in September. Perfected in the magic of March. For the fans who love the crunch of the pads, prefer a dunk and expect nothing but the best. It's Bigger Tech. Here's Steve Dace. And greetings. Welcome to this week's episode of Bigger Ten. I'm Steve Dace. Alongside my co-host, the one and only Aaron McIntyre. What a glorious Labor Day weekend. The college football season, brother, is now fully upon us. Are you ready to break it down and look ahead to week two? Let's do it. Yeah. So without further ado, like he just said. And they don't call him the best color man in the business for nothing. I was just trying to work out in there explaining why my face is not quite ready for football season. I've been molting for the last two days after sitting out in 90 plus degree uh, heat all uh, all Saturday in Kinnick Stadium. Um, How was that, by the way? Well, we were sitting in the corner in the front row in the corner, which I knew going in, you know, chance of having some action down uh, action down there. But um and we did, we did, but I knew that we were going to have to be, you know, watching the video board for most of the game for anything that's beyond like the the four, our own forty yard line. Problem was the video board wasn't working for oh boy a, a bunch of the day. And so basically, in the morning there was a cool breeze sweat that out was there nice. All day long is what you did. There was a cool breeze in the morning. Then by like the middle of the third quarter, the breeze is hot. The one point five liter water bottle I brought in, the water is hot, and and the offense was not hot at that point. No. In fact, we will get to that here at some point on the bigger on the big five here on Bigger Ten. But we got to start with an offense that has even more problems than Iowa's. And we haven't said that very often over the years, but Ohio State officially now has gone from a quarterback situation to a quarterback problem. Worst passing day of the Ryan Day era. Fewest points scored against Indiana in 30 years. And this kind of, I think, sums up what, what the offense looked like for the Buckeyes. Roman Wilson for Michigan had three touchdown catches. Aaron, Marvin Harrison had two catches total against Indiana for 18 yards. Offensive line wasn't good. Quarterbacks weren't good. Devin Brown is wearing 33 for reasons. I don't know, man. That... That's just not what we're accustomed to seeing out of the Buckeyes. So it's week one. So you know what that means? Overreaction. Yeah. Because we have no games in nine months, so we can only react to what we've seen with a limited sample size. So what's your concern scale for the Bucks? I'm at like a seven and a half right now. Oh, wow. Okay. I've been saying all offseason, well, you have that receiving core. How good does your quarterback need to be? Well, apparently he needs to be better than Kyle McCord was on Saturday. <laughs> now, there has been talk, and I believe Ryan Day even said this uh, post-game, or maybe it was in his uh, early week uh, press conference, that he was calling plays rather conservatively. And I don't know what the reason for that would be. Uh, maybe he just wasn't expecting what he Indiana had the under? brought. Did he have the under? He could have. He could he just have. Said maybe he's had the under. Uh, okay. James Franklin had uh, them covering and the and the uh, over <laughs> the other night. Um, so nice. I'm at like a seven and a half right now. Everybody's, uh, you know, o- Ohio State land is pumping the brakes. Hey, C.J. Stroud against Oregon, you know, he didn't look good, and that's true. He didn't look he good. He threw for 400 yards in that game. But they he just lost. He, he then he then in the second half figured it out. And yeah. started chucking it all around the field. Oh, you're court. thinking of the win- the opener against Minnesota that Thursday. Oh night yeah, game. yeah, no, no, yeah. you're correct. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. But then the next week they played Oregon at and home. He threw for 400 yards and they still lost. But yeah. 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 Um, so I, I would say those situations right now are not analogous. Now you could come out against Youngstown State and maybe that's just the, what the doctor ordered and they put things together again. This is week one, but man alive, I was listening to that on the way home. Uh, on you know by myself on Highway Six because I eighty was ridiculous, uh, and I'm like, do do something, please do something. And it was just, eventually they got the job done. You know, if Indiana had more than a pulse offensively, that that thing could have, that thing could have gotten dangerous real quick, real, real quick on the Buckeyes. I would say my concern meter is at a five and a half, um, but when you're Ohio State playing Indiana, there shouldn't be a concern meter after the game. Yeah. That's, I think, 
the issue that there's one at all. All right, speaking of concern meters, now, in Lincoln, Nebraska, they just don't even have... It's like bringing a Geiger, Geiger counter to Chernobyl. It's a pointless exercise, okay? So they don't even have concern meters anymore in Lincoln. It's just their natural habitat. Nevertheless, for the Matt Rule era to begin as this, just as the Scott Frost era ended, in terms of game control, the Huskers were in control of this game, at least defensively, all game long, blow it at the end, all right? And, and this is just since 2019, Aaron, just yeah. since 2019. This is the 16th one-score loss Nebraska has since 2019. And in, uh, and in 10 of those games now, counting this one, in 10 of those games, they led in the second half. Six, I'm sorry, 17 one-score losses. And in 10 of them, they led in the second half. Since of all the way, if you're Matt Rule, wouldn't you have been better off just going out there, losing 42 to 10? And you're like, hey, you know, we're reinventing ourselves. You know, a bunch of new guys. Minnesota's been a solid program in this league. You, of the, the one outcome that could not happen, could not if you're Matt Rule, is you could not go out there and just Scott Frost it in game one in a one-score game. That's the one thing if you're a Husker fan, you probably thought, I, I will take any outcome. Hey, we'll suck in year one, Matt Rule sucked. Matt Rule started one and six at Temple, yeah. one and six at Baylor. I'll rationalize it. Yeah. But we cannot go out there and lead until the final few minutes and blow the game again. We cannot do that, right? So this is just uncanny, as you pointed out, all the, all the stats that you just threw out there. And I'll, I'll tell you, 8.45 on Thursday night, I was ready to come in here on Wednesday as we were taping this. I was ready to overreact positively to Nebraska. I was ready to come in here, sing their praises for a, a, a few reasons. Number one, I thought up until the fumble in the middle of the fourth quarter, I thought they looked not only in control, but under control. That's how many a good point. How yeah. many times uh, throughout, whether it's Lincoln, uh, I'm sorry, uh, whether it's Mike Riley, whether it's Scott Frost, how many times have we been able to say about a Nebraska team, wow, they just look like they're under control. Yeah, they're stuck defensively, together. Yeah. Defensively, they were, especially early in the game, they were flying to the ball. That was a legitimately physical Big Ten football game. I thought in the third quarter they looked even stronger and were getting stronger as the game wore on. I was ready to come in here and sing their praises. I was ready to overreact, and then they fumbled. But it's okay, they got the ball back, and then they threw an interception. <laughs> It's just gosh. like even even <laughs> Jeff Sims. I mean, he had a kind of a bad interception towards uh, or maybe through two interceptions in the first half, had that crazy trick play where he just calm, cool, collected, picked up the football, caught it midair, threw it for a touchdown. I'm like, hey, hey, he's mentally tough. He came back for, uh, now after this game. I, I have no idea what to make of it for both teams. Um, just uncanny. How Nebraska finds ways to lose games. It's just you want, you want to talk about two old conference rivals who mentally are in completely different places. Nebraska, Colorado this week. Mm -hmm. I mean, Co Colorado is going to come in for their home opener, brother. Like they, like they are literally soaring through the air. They're going to have a hard time keeping their feet on the ground. Nebraska's daubers have to be down. That that. That, that game's going to require psychoanalysis to handicap. All right, let's get to number three on the list. Uh, meet the new Iowa offense, same as the old Iowa offense. Now, first quarter, it didn't look like this. Cade McNamara is just throwing dimes. Everything looks great, you know? And, and so I get embroiled in the Michigan game. And so I, I don't, you know, after, so I'm watching Iowa on my, on my iPad because I'm, I'm curious to watch Cade's debut. He gets off to that hot start, hits that second touchdown to Eric All on fourth down. I stopped watching, basically, figuring, okay, they got it. That's my Cade McNamara that I used to know in Ann Arbor. He's going to right the ship. We're good here. And and I, I tune in. Your game lasted longer than mine. I oh. tune in at the end, and I'm like, wait a minute, it's 24 to 14. Like Iowa has like no one other touchdown since then. And I look at the stats. Utah State has more yards, more first downs. What was that? And, and if you only scored 24 against Utah State, that's probably the worst team on Iowa's schedule. And you got to average 25 for the season for Brian Ferentz to keep his job. I don't know, you know, start prorating that. What do you got to score? 
here the next few weeks? 40 a game to get back on track? I mean, given the... 25.1. Yeah, but I mean, to, to, to justify the 25 you didn't score against Utah State. Mm-hmm. You figured you probably had to score like 35 against them, right? Mm-hmm. Given who some of your teams are later on. But you were there, man, sweating to the uh, sweating all the way to the last minute. So you tell me what you saw. Yeah, I was hoping they'd be up by like three touchdowns at the end of the third quarter so we could like, get out of there early and uh, avoid the heat. But uh, that was not the case. So I'm not quite as pessimistic as you are, although I, it was frustrating watching that. But going back and watching the game over again, there were some things that I saw that were legitimately better. L- listen, you sound upset. Are you upset that like the ratio of touchdowns to safeties is all out of whack uh, for <laughs> Iowa? Because I think are you going to say this is Phil Parker's fault? Hey, you're supposed to contribute a touchdown a week. Three, three touchdowns and a field goal is better in my book than two safeties and a field goal, which is how we started out off last year. So, so there's that. I thought overall, though, I mean that first quarter did happen. So that's a you know that's that's the first opening drive of the season touchdown pass to any receiver since before I was born. Nineteen ninety one. Nineteen ninety one. That was the first uh, open opening quarter to a season touchdown pass to a wide receiver since like two thousand three in Clinton Solomon. Okay, so that was fun to see. What was nineteen ninety one like? Matt Rogers to Dane and Hughes, maybe. I don't even. Remember. You wouldn't even know those names. No, you weren't I even was alive negative yet. Negative two years old. So, yeah. I'm not quite as pessimistic. The pass protection, other than one or two breakdowns, was phenomenal. Actually, on Saturday, the run blocking. Well, let's talk about the pass protection because mm. the run blocking was terrible. But again, eight man box. I, I'm not going to overreact too much to the negatives. I'm not going to overreact too much to that first quarter. Um, it was an improvement, though, from how we started the year last year. Cade McNamara is at like 60% which with his injury, um, and him at 60% is light years beyond Spencer Petras. Great guy, high character, blah, 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 blah. He's far and away. There's better. lots of people with high character that shouldn't be a quarterback yeah. of a Big Ten football team. Yeah. 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 So that's my take on Iowa. Well, speaking of quarterbacks... Drew Aller, Drew Aller, sensational debut for Penn State. And we have been saying on this show all offseason that this may be the most important player in our league because we said all of last season that we thought Penn State was a 2023 team. This roster is set up for a run, but the question is at quarterback, you're replacing a sixth year senior who was okay, but you, you, you can't be breaking in a quarterback with such a loaded roster. You don't want the quarterback to hold the roster back. Well, Aaron, debut, 72% completions, three touchdowns, no picks. I know West Virginia is not good. They were throwing a, a lot of defensive looks. Yeah, at it's him. a power oh, five team. Yeah. And you would think West Virginia, with nine months to prepare mm-hmm. and, and a primetime audience, took this game very seriously. Here's the thing, too, that stuck out to me. You mentioned the great stat about Iowa. First opening drive touchdown pass to start a season since 1991. Uh, Aller finished with a QBR of about 86 in this game. So Sean Clifford was a sixth-year COVID senior last year. So in Aller's first start, he would have finished with the third-best QBR that Sean Clifford had all of last year when Penn State won 11 games and the Rose Bowl. So if you're a Penn State fan... I, I don't know, knowing that you have so many other known commodities, Nate Singleton, um, Olu Fashanu, Abdul Carter, uh, Chop Robinson. I mean, there, there's a lot of known players. on The only program other than Michigan that brought back more known playmakers was Penn State. The question is, though, at the most important position, was that guy ready to step in? And at least for week one... Yep. He absolutely looked like a five-star quarterback. I cautioned people, I think, last week on, on the show and definitely on confi- confidence picks, hey, it might, there might be some growing pains. We all expect good things. But there, I didn't really see, other than nitpicking a couple of throws that maybe he shouldn't have made, the dude was on point. And what's most impressive, yeah, he has the physical tools. That's pretty easy to see. But I watched that entire game. West Virginia was throwing a lot of different defensive looks at Penn State, and he's processing things very, very well. At least from my eye. Again, I'm not a, uh, I'm not a, um, not a coach anything at that level. But man, his vision as well. Some of those throws that he made required some pretty good vision of the field. Couldn't have been, at least in his debut, more impressed with Drew Alar. And finally, Northwestern. Um, what Rutgers did to them on Sunday. That might be 
the most physically dominant win Rutgers has had since it came to our league. If you look at the stat profile for Northwestern in that opener against the Scarlet Knights, it looks like Rutgers played an FCS opponent. This week, Northwestern is an underdog at home to UTEP, who just lost to Jacksonville State in Week 0 in Jacksonville State's first ever FBS game. Now, you are too young to remember Francis P., and the only Denny Green you remember is they are who we thought they were. Yeah. But he was once the coach at Northwestern. And this and Francis P. and Denny Green were coach at Northwestern in the 80s when the longest losing streak in college football. This program looks like it is on the way to cratering. Given the four teams that are about to come in, did you see where they were ranked this week? Okay. The four programs that are about to enter our league, I know there was all this talk in August, even from people I like and respect like Andy Staples. This is a coveted job. No, it's no, not. No, it's not. No. <laughs> you're, th- this, this job, you're, 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 you're going to be the 19th program in a league of 18. I, I don't see how they're getting back up anytime soon. I don't know why you would go there as opposed to the other at least 12, if not 15 of the other 18 programs in this league. Um, I think they're in real trouble. And, and I think they're, they're heading towards a program crater similar to what we saw in the 1980s. Yeah, my analysis, which really wasn't good, but my analysis going into this game and our confidence picks was if there's one game where Northwestern should or could get up off the mat just for one game, it's the one that you have the most time to prepare for, and we just didn't see that. I mean, Rutgers just smashed them in the mouth in that first half. The first two drives just, you know, it wasn't chunk plays either. It was just uh, rock em, sock em all the way down the field. And I, I, I don't know if they get off, off the mat the rest of the season. Should have probably bet the under on their win total. Uh, because this is just offensively, they they look they looked worse than Iowa last year. Even though they scored a touchdown in this game, they they looked just helpless, really on both sides of the ball at times throughout the re- throughout the course of that game. I mean, I, I think it's conceivable it could be a minimum of five years before you see Northwestern playing a bowl game again. Yeah. Minimum. Yep. All right, we'll come back play our weekly game of Would You Rather here in just a moment. All right, Aaron, let's fire it up. Another week of Would You Rather here on Bigger Ten. Aaron, would you rather bet Northwestern or Indiana Moneyline if they played on a neutral field after what we just saw last Saturday and Sunday? Indiana, that's an easy call. I think their defense I think their defense is, is actually respectable. The hey, hey, the BTN crew did say yeah. they thought Indiana's defensive line was markedly improved from the year before. Yeah, so I don't know what they're doing on offense, but defensively, I mean, that, that'll at least keep them in, in, that, in that game. So I would take Indiana pretty, pretty, uh, uh, pretty convincingly. All right, here's a quick one then. What's the total? Indiana Northwestern on a neutral field, what's the total? 30? 31? Uh, I would say 30. I mean, that's yikes. Yeah. Okay. This one's for you. Would you rather bet Michigan to cover 36 and a half against UNLV or bet Wisconsin to cover six against Washington State? I'd rather bet Michigan the 36 and a half. I, I, I don't know if you looked at the actual statistics of UNLV against Bryant. I know the scoreboard said otherwise. Basically, Bryant and UNLV had the exact same stat profile. Um, I, I was very impressed with Washington State going on the road to Colorado State. Every sharp in America was pretty much on that game. That game opened at, tw- at, at, at 12. It closed at 8 on Saturday because of the amount of sharps that were betting that game on every po- college football betting podcast you could find. And Washington State was never threatened at all. They played Wisconsin a year ago and they beat them in Madison. Wisconsin going to this new offense won't be a challenge to Washington State at all. They see that in the Pac-12 every week. They see it in practice every day. So, and the Palouse is not an easy place to play. And we know what the record of Big Ten teams happens to be over the years going cross country for these matchups. So I, I would be more comfortable that Michigan would win like 42 to three than, than laying a full touchdown on the road for Wisconsin. All right, for you, would you rather bet Nebraska or Purdue to go on the road and give their new head coaches their first wins at their respective schools this weekend? Nebraska. Really? Okay. Yeah. Now, you mentioned that, you know, the dynamic coming into this game couldn't be more polar opposite. 
Yeah, that's true, but that can also work the other way for Colorado. They're getting a lot of attention this week. Mm-hmm. I think it was a good win. Don't don't get any of that wrong. Uh, don't get me wrong. Uh, that was a good win uh, coming in. All of these questions in the offseason, it was a very good win over the national runners-up in their own crib. Having said that, it is also possible that people are vastly overreacting to what Colorado is or could be. So I, I think I'd rather pick Nebraska. I, I did still like some of the things that I saw from them, especially defensively. So I'd rather pick Nebraska. Finally, for you, would you rather your team roll in week one? No questions. No question marks. We got things figured out. We look good. Or struggle, but still win by a comfortable margin. So you win by a comfortable margin, but there's a lot of stuff to work, up, uh, work on. And, you know, you don't get too, uh, too high and mighty right away. It depends on who we're playing week two. So, for example, if I'm your team and I'm playing my in-state rival, I'd rather have the second scenario. Um, Because now I have their attention. You get cocky. Everything's great in practice. And first time you go out there and play another colored uniform and there are some kinks and a reminder that you ain't all that. If I'm Michigan, my favorite team, and my next game's against UNLV, the former. Yeah, because we're playing against ourselves. You see what I'm saying? Yep. So if if we're if you're Michigan and you're and you're opening up against a scrub, and the next week you're playing a scrub, you're playing against yourself. So you want to achieve at the high at a high level because you're playing against yourself. If I'm Iowa though, and I'm looking to iron out some kinks and and humble a team before a big rivalry game on the road, I think I'd rather have the second scenario. And one thing we've seen throughout the years of the Iowa Iowa State rivalry, the way you performed the previous week, completely irrelevant to how you're going to play the following week. Yep. Just seen that a million times. So I'm, there have been years where Iowa should have lost to North to Northern Iowa on field goals, and you know then you know went undefeated. Um, there have been years when Iowa State should have lost at home to Illinois State and then beat top ten Iowa teams. The way each team plays the week prior is just completely irrelevant in, in many cases. So something to keep an eye on. All right, we'll come back, wrap things up with this week's Twitter poll results and our question of the week next. This week's. Twitter poll results, your biggest surprise of week one in the Big Ten, 37% voted first and foremost for the struggling Ohio State quarterbacks, 29% the struggling Michigan offensive line, and that's relative compared to you know Michigan's standard of winning the Joe Moore Award the last two years in a row. The struggling Illinois defense, we did not talk about them. Gave up, only averaged 273 yards on defense giving up last year. Gave up well over 400 yards to Toledo right out of the gate without Ryan Walters and all those pro guys in the secondary. 6.2% said, yeah, we weren't really, I guess Drowler, five-star quarterback, stellar debut, was our biggest surprise. Your thoughts on those results here? I think the percentages or at least the ratios for the top two are probably where they should be. I, I don't really agree with the characterization of Illinois' struggling D. That's a really, really tough matchup right off the gate. I mean, right out of the gate. Toledo's picked, a, I think, win the MAC and the way they play offense and that quarterback. That's just a really tough draw right out, out the gate. So I, you know, not necessarily giving them a pass. I mean, there were some moments where I was like, man, alive, physically, they don't look like they're going to be able to hold up. But I would, I would pump the brakes on, on uh, declaring them struggling. But Aller, um, his debut, it's not really that big of a surprise. A lot of people have been high on him. I mean, I said maybe pump the brakes, but he even proved me wrong. So the ratios, all in all, other than the uh, struggling Illinois D, I, I'd largely agree with. Well, here's the thing with Illinois' defense. They're playing the exact same offense this year, or this week, on the road, yeah. even faster tempo with an even better quarterback. Yeah. So keep that in mind. All right, question of the week. In response to if Iowa isn't going to get the 25 points that Brian Ferentz needs to average against this team, 10 sends, I love that name, says even with Cade McNamara, Eric Hall, and and all the hype about the offensive line and running backs, Iowa only had 196 passing yards and 88 yards rushing against Utah State. Go figure. Yeah, I mean, that's football. I believe that's a quote from Kirk Ferentz that got him in a lot of hot water. There's also, I would like to say, here's what I would like to say, and probably what I'm supposed to say as an Iowa fan. It could just be that Brian Ferentz is just, they got to 24 points and they just gave him the middle finger like, yeah, we're not going to play this game. Because there is no enforcement mechanism in this contract. 
It just says you have to get 25 points. It doesn't say if you don't get 25 points, you'll get fired. There's no enforcement mechanism. It's just, it's just words. But um, here's the thing about that, just saying F you. They weren't really in a position to do that for most of the day. Now it looked like it. They were. It looked like this was going to be hundred to nothing in the first quarter. Mm-hmm. But it's not like they were toying with Utah State for the rest of the game. I mean, there were a few dropped passes that plagued them that might have made this look a little bit different. But uh, yeah, for three quarters of that game, this was this was um, this looked familiar. We'll just say that. Well. It's nice to get back to talk to being familiar with talking football again. And we'll be here again next week to do the same. A huge week of non-conference matchups in college football. Uh, and so we look forward to watching those and then talking about them next week right here on Bigger Ten. In the meantime, please like, rate, subscribe, share, follow, five-star review. Uh, no matter how you watch, like on YouTube or where you listen, like on iTunes, help us to find more Big Ten fans just like you. Follow us in between episodes, especially on game day, at Bigger Ten on X or Twitter or whatever the heck it's called now, at Bigger Ten. For Aaron McIntyre, I'm Steve Dace. We'll see you next week right here on Bigger Ten. Bigger Ten.